Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. This is Susan Coffin. I'm here for Attitude Magazine. This month, we're talking about ADHD myths. I'm extremely pleased to have Dr. Thomas Brown of Yale University with us today. He's the author of a new book called A New Understanding of ADHD in Children and Adults. And it specifically addresses the myths about ADHD and presents a broader understanding of the disorder, one that takes it from, has previously thought of a mere behavioral problem to a much larger and more synthetic view of the ADHD brain and emotions and what the disorder actually is about. Any of you, I think, would find his book fascinating, and I urge you to look for it. So with that, let me welcome Dr. Brown. Thank you him so much for being our guest today. We're very grateful for the time that he gives us. So thank you so much, Dr. Brown. Well, thank over you. To you. I'm really glad to be here and, and to be able to share this information with you folks. Uh, the first one is one uh, which says ADHD isn't a real disorder. Uh, and there are a number of people who still believe that, even though there's a mountain of scientific evidence about it. Uh, I'm not going to review all that evidence right now, but I think that uh, one way of thinking about it is, well, if somebody has ADHD, what are the impairments that they have? What sort of difficulties does this create for people? And the other question is, what kind of evidence do we have about there being something that's going on in the brain? Uh, that might uh, you know, provide uh, something more solid in terms of evidence of, of this being something that's actually going on and not simply a matter of pe- people being lazy or, or not very smart. Um, and rather than review the whole uh, range of evidence, because we've got a lot of more specific things to talk about today, I'd just like to uh, offer one example, the impact on education. Uh, is substantial, and there's one study that uh, was published uh, that was done in Canada with 2,000 kids that I thought was particularly interesting. And what they uh, did was to, over the course of kindergarten through 12th grade, with these 2,000 kids, uh, they asked the teacher each year who was working with that particular child uh, to rank them in terms of uh, rate them according to uh, what sort of difficulty they were having with attention and what sort of difficulty they were having uh, with hyperactivity. And then what they did was to uh, take a look at those scores, not just one year at a time, but look at those who uh, had the uh, scores at the end, each one of them, uh, when they got to the point where they were 23 years old and out of school. And the question was, how many of these kids graduated from high school? By the age of 23, how many of them actually had a high school diploma? And it was really quite uh, dramatic if you look at the difference between them. If you looked at those kids who were rated as having the highest levels of difficulty uh, with the problems of of inattention and or the problems of hyperactivity, and they were were rated separately, by the way, um, what they found was that those were in the highest levels of of inattention uh, symptoms, 70% of those, 70.8 to be exact, by the time they were 23 years old, had not yet completed a high school diploma. Over 70% hadn't yet been able to graduate with a diploma from high school. And you can say, well, that's interesting, but uh, what percentage of people in this sample uh, did graduate? And if they looked at those who had the lower rates of inattention symptoms, it was only 11.5%. So we're not talking about a particular teacher. We're talking about the ratings of teachers over time, K through 12, and noticing that that very basic level of education just was not completed by 70% of these kids who were rated as high in in problems with inattention. Uh, And there are similar figures for the hyperactivity. Now, what's going on in the brain? Why is it that these people, you know, other things we could cite in terms of difficulty with jobs, difficulty with the personal relationships, difficulty with a variety of specific tasks that can be done in laboratory or just outside in real life. But uh, let's ask, okay, well, what's going on in the brain? I'm going to get to this a little more later, but let me just mention, we have known for a long time 
that, and remember, this is a diagnosis that was originally re- written up in, the, in English literature for medicine in 1902. And from then until 1980, it was mostly thought of as a behavior problem. Little kids who couldn't sit still wouldn't shut up and were driving everybody nuts. And it wasn't until 1980 that they finally introduced the term attention deficit into the name of the disorder. And so for a long time, and even in, in the minds of many people still, this is seen as a behavior problem. But what we now know is that there are many people who have ADHD who've never had any significant behavior problems. That really the, the problems, that, and even for those who have, that's usually the least of it, because the problems are the bigger part of the difficulty for most of these folks, particularly as they begin to get a little bit older in the upper grades of school, have to do with attention. And attention is, of course, defined in this disorder very broadly to cover a variety of cognitive functions. And what's behind that in terms of brain? We're going to talk in a little while about brain development. There are differences in brain development that we can now see in imaging studies that we couldn't see before. There are differences in terms of the way in which the chemicals and neurotransmitter chemicals operate and carrying messages from uh, one neural circuit to another. There are differences in the white matter, the uh, wiring that connects one part of the brain with another, and there are differences in terms of the way in which the oscillations that the brain uses to connect and sort of tune in one section of the brain with another uh, in terms of to to what extent the the individual is able to shut off the slow spaced out kind of oscillations and focus on the things that are needed to focus uh, on any particular task. So is it a real disorder? Well, there's still some people who'd argue that way, but most of them are just not looking at the evidence either in terms of impairment or in terms of differences in brain function. And we'll talk more about those differences in brain function shortly. Now, the next slide talks about parenting, because a lot of parents who have kids uh, who have difficulties with ADD enough to uh, make it, get a diagnosis tend to beat themselves up a little bit and think, oh, my God, you know, what, what did I not do to help my son or daughter be able to manage these things? Uh, or they'll be getting criticism sometimes from relatives or from teachers or from others. Uh, and it's, it's interesting because sometimes the criticism is in the form of, of saying, you've got to tighten up, you've got to uh, hold this kid more accountable. Uh, and other times it's you need to back off and give them more support and be more sensitive uh, as though somehow if only one were to, to be able to provide more structure, more confrontation, more affection, then the ADHD wouldn't be there. And the fact is that's not the case. That we're talking here about problems that have to do with the unfolding development of the brain's management system. And it's certainly true that if a child is growing up in an environment where other people are constantly criticizing them and can see only their problems and not their strengths and never mention anything about what's good about them, uh, that certainly makes living with ADHD more difficult, but it's not a cause for the disorder. It's quite clear from a large number of studies of the heritability of this disorder that this is essentially, in most cases, inherited. You know, there are certainly some uh, characteristics like problems with uh, perinatal difficulties, uh, problems during pregnancy or kids that are born after very protracted labor or kids where the cord is around their neck as they are coming through the birth canal and and the the respiratory system is not functioning uh, as it should when they're first born. Um, Some of those things can happen, but uh, when you look at, at the heritability uh, this one's in families. Out of every four people diagnosed with ADHD, and incidentally, I use the terms ADD and ADHD interchangeably in, in conversation like this, uh, that what you find is out of every four, at least one of them is going to have a mom or dad who has the problem, whether they know it or not, because in the old days, they were never any good at diagnosing this. Uh, and the other three, if they don't have a parent who has it, usually they've got a grandparent or an uncle or an aunt or a cousin or brother or sister. Yeah, and where do we get that number? Heritability indexes uh, in science are used uh, a num- it's number between a number between zero and one, and zero means not, not much at all in the way of genetic influences, and uh, one that's pretty much the story. And for comparison, on that scale, breast cancer, and these, this is based on the on twin studies, where you compare 
identical uh, twins against uh, those who don't share all the, the genetic material. Uh, breast cancer is about 0.3, asthma is about 0.5, height is about 0.9, and ADD is 0.76, and that's based on about 20, 22 twin studies. So we know that this runs in families. It's highly heritable. And it doesn't mean that every kid is getting it from one of his parents, but uh, many are, and if not, they're usually some uncles or aunts or grandparents or others in the family who, who've got it. You know, years ago, they told us that uh, there are six boys had ADHD for every one girl. You know where they got that number? It, it's a number that was derived from counting kids that were dragged into child guidance clinics. And when they went out and did epidemiological studies, the numbers came out much more like three to one, three boys for every one girl. Uh, but when you begin to look at data from adults, the adults who turn up at clinics and get diagnosed, or when you do a study like the, the National Comorbidity Study that uh, did a study of uh, epidemiological sample, uh, it gets a lot closer to one to one. You know, the comorbidity study uh, on ADHD uh, picked up about, uh, for every uh, one female, there's about 1.6, and these are adults they're looking at. 1.6 males for every one male. So you've got a, a, a larger percentage, but many of the clinics which are dealing with ADHD uh, find that uh, it's just about one for one, you know, just about as many women as there are men who are seeking treatment for adults. And so the question then is, well, what's with that? Why is it that you've got a, a larger percentage? Because three to one is much closer, for example, for kids. And I think the answer is pretty simple. Uh, and that is that most girls, not all, there's some girls that make just as much in the way of behavioral difficulties in the classroom and at home as any boy does. Uh, but the majority of girls who have this problem are not showing problems that are making that much trouble for parents or for teachers. And so as a result, they're less likely to get brought in for treatment when they're kids. And often it's not until a woman, a young woman or an older woman, uh, it gets to the point where they're taking on adult responsibilities and they're fully capable of seeking treatment for themselves that they will actually be seeking treatment and get it for themselves. And it's at that point you begin to find not much difference between males and females in terms of who has ADD. Now, the next slide is talking about little kids and it's making a flat statement that says, you can't medicate a child under six years of age, presumably for ADHD. Well, that's not quite what the American Academy of Pediatrics thinks. And uh, last year, in 2012, they came out with guidelines for the assessment and treatment of ADHD. And what they said is if you've got a young child in the age of four to five years old uh, who's manifesting symptoms of ADHD, that the first bet is to try to uh, do some behavioral intervention, try to help the parents to get a more, behavior, more adequate behavioral uh, program going with the kid to try and get some of those behaviors under control if possible. Um, but if after a period of nine months you're not able to get an adequate response, then the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, recommends a trial of stimulant medication. And a lot of people say, oh my God, why would you want to be medicating child that young? Well, most of the kids that I see who are in that age group when I'm getting a preschooler brought in or a kindergarten kid, usually it's a safety problem. That Many of these kids are extremely difficult to manage. Many of them have a lot of difficulty getting to sleep at night. Uh, they often uh, have way more tantrums than you get with most kids and sometimes they're physically aggressive, like if they've got a younger a little brother or sister smaller than themselves where you worry about whether they're going to hurt the kid. Or just get themselves in trouble. These are the kids that if you take them to the grocery store and you don't have their, hand, their wrist carefully held when you get them out of the car seat in the parking lot, uh, you know, they're likely, once they get loose, to just run between cars and, and uh, you know, impulsively behave in ways that can put them in danger. And the government, this is not a study that was sponsored by uh, some pharmaceutical company, but the uh, preschool ADHD treatment study, which was sponsored by the federal government in the U.S., um, was evaluating medication response for children ages three to five and a half uh, who were diagnosed with ADHD. And they were looking not just a little bit of it, it's where the symptoms were moderate to severe. 
And what they found in that study was that after they did, a, they, they began with a, a course of behavioral treatment first to see if that would work. And most of the kids, it didn't make much difference. These, these kids had enough trouble that they, they needed far more than just what you can get when teaching parents how to uh, manage the kids' behavior a little bit better. And when they, what they found was that with a, when they were using methylphenidate, that the kids generally responded pretty well to it. They, you saw a few more side effects, nothing terribly severe, uh, and stuff that could usually be uh, dealt with by adjusting the dose. If anything, their doses were running a little low with some of those kids. Uh, but the fact is that those children who are being brought in for uh, in the preschool years and kindergarten years with significant ADHD impairments are often kids who are at considerable risk either of just getting hurt by their own carelessness and impulsiveness, their inability to uh, comply with adult directions as much as most other kids of the same age, um, and they're a safety risk. And they also, in some cases, are so difficult to manage that they're at risk of getting hurt at home because they often are very difficult to get to sleep at night. They'll be waking up other kids when you're trying to get them settled down, and some parents just lose it with them and will come in and say, you know, I I don't like to hit my kid, but uh, this kid is just driving me right up the wall. And so that's something that uh, needs to be taken seriously. And you certainly don't want to jump into conclusions in medicating a child until you've taken a careful look at what the problems are. Sometimes there are family problems going on. Sometimes there are issues with siblings uh, that need to be addressed. Sometimes there are behavioral things where parents are unwittingly encouraging some of the things they're trying to stop. But once that's been looked at and you've tried uh, just making common sense changes in terms of behavioral management strategies, If they're still having a lot of difficulty, then it makes sense to take a look very carefully at uh, the option of some medication for them. The next slide talks about uh, do most kids outgrow ADHD. It used to be everybody thought that if you had this, you'd outgrow it by the time you hit about uh, 13, 14, 15 years old around puberty. That would be the end of it. But that was based at a time when they, for those decades, that they were looking at this simply as a behavioral problem. What we know now is that if you take into account the full range, including the cognitive problems, that that's usually the the biggest part of the problem for those kids go on. The the hyperactivity and impulsivity that you see in some kids with ADHD, certainly not all of them, usually does get better as they get a little bit older. I'm talking now about just middle to to late elementary school, early adolescence. There's some uh, who go on into adulthood and are, are, you know, it seems like they've got only two speeds, full speed ahead or asleep. Uh, but the majority of them, you see much less of the hyperactivity as they get into adolescence and early adulthood. Uh, and so that's why for so long everybody just thought you outgrew it because all they were looking at was the hyperactivity. But what we now know is that uh, when you take a look at longer-term studies, on average about you know, 3%, about 30%, 3 out of 10, who have ADHD as kids, uh, outgrow it to the point where you just don't see much in the way of difficulty with ADHD symptoms anymore as they get into uh, mid to late adolescence. But seven out of ten, they persist. The difficulties persist. The hardest time for most children uh, with ADHD is usually junior high, high school, in the first couple of years of university because that's the time when you have the widest range of tasks to do with the least opportunity to escape from the ones you're not that good at. And you know, if you're lucky, when you get out of, uh, say, if you're in university and you go on to a third and fourth year, if you're lucky, uh, you can get in something you're more able to spe- you know, specialize in something that's more interesting to you. And you've got your mandatory requirements out of the way, and uh, it gets more interesting, which makes it a lot easier to manage the work. If you're really lucky, you get a job where you can get paid for doing what you can do well and let somebody else do the stuff that you're not that good at. However, um uh, the fact is that there's still a lot of adults uh, who continue to have symptoms that make difficulty for them. And, and that is related to two different things. One is context. That if you're lucky enough to get into a situation where your work is something that you like to do and that you're interested in, at least mostly, uh, then you may not have much trouble with ADHD. 
For example, I see a number of, of patients, adult patients, who work in sales work, and they call on customers, and many of them needed medicine full day for when they were in school, but when they got into their job, they find they don't need it when they're out selling and meeting with customers. That's like a game for them as a sport. But they certainly need it when they're getting their orders put together and getting their paperwork and their expense accounts done. You know, so there's some tasks in adult life where some people with ADD continue to have trouble, but they don't have so much trouble with others. In some cases, people will have a partnership with a, in marriage or another partnership uh, where somebody else, that their partner, is taking care of keeping the family finances straight uh, while they can uh, make other contributions to the household. So the context makes a difference. But the other thing that we're learning more about now is brain development makes a difference. And the study that was done by Philip Shaw and colleagues at the National Institute of Mental Health, there have been several series, but they did one study of, of over, uh, over 200 kids uh, whom they picked up in you know, mid to late childhood and then followed every year and a half with brain scans, MRI scans. And what they found was that uh, when they compared them with a comparable group of kids who did not have ADHD, that the brain development was quite similar in the two groups for most of the brain, in that there's a period that usually peaks around puberty where there's massive proliferation of cortical cells, followed by a number of years of pruning to get more efficient circuits. And when they looked at that overall in the brains of the ADHD kids and compared them with the brains of the kids who did not have ADHD, they found most of it was pretty much the same across the two groups, except there are about five different areas where the kids with ADHD were running about three years to five years behind in that developmental process of the proliferation of the cells and then the, the pruning. And those areas happen to be the areas where these executive functions uh, have their, their most important areas that's, uh, of the brain that support them. And there's also some di difference, a new study that just came out this past month uh, in biological psychiatry by the Shaw Group was uh, showing that there are some differences in terms of the thinning of cortical tissue uh, and that adults uh, who continue to have significant ADHD symptoms also tend to have thinner cortical layer. So there's some real differences that you can measure with these imaging scans uh, for some adults where they're not growing, outgrowing the ADHD. The symptoms persist and the differences in brain development persist. And there are also a number of others who, you know, they're running maybe three years, maybe five years behind, and then uh, uh, the growth catches up and they're doing pretty well, which accounts for the sort of thing we see clinically sometimes where you have a... Uh, a kid who may who fail out of university or college when they first go in and or bounce around from one school to another for a couple of years, and then uh, maybe they get out and work for a couple of years, do something else, then come back again, and they're honor students. What changed? Sometimes what's changed is the development of the brain during that time. Now, the next slide talks about how ADHD kids and adults have no ability to concentrate and focus. Anybody who has known anybody with ADHD very well at all know that's not true. And one of the things that, that I've tried to write about and talk about a lot because I've really been struck by it is that I have seen thousands of people, children, teenagers, and adults with ADHD, and every one of them has a few activities in which they can pay attention, focus, and concentrate as well as anybody else can of the same age. And they're different things for different people. You have to ask about it and see what it is. But uh, for some, it's playing a sport. For others, it, it's making art or making music. For others, it's repairing cars. For others, it's playing video games. But everybody I've ever seen who has this disorder has a few activities in which they've got no trouble focusing at all, even though on almost everything else, they've got a lot of trouble focusing. And if you ask them, they say, what's with this? How come you can do it here and you can't do it there? Usually what they'll say is something like this. It's easy. If it's something I'm interested in, I can pay attention. If not, I can't. And most people hearing that will say, yeah, right, congratulations. That's true for anybody. Anybody's going to pay attention better for something they're interested in than for something they're not, which is true. But here's the difference. People who don't have ADD, they've got something they've got to do, and they know they've got to do it, and it's important. They can usually make themselves pay attention, even if it's pretty boring, just because they know they've got to do it. 
People with ADD, it's incredibly difficult for them to be able to make themselves pay attention unless the task is something that's really interesting to them, not because somebody says it ought to be because it'll help your future, but just because it is interesting for whatever reason. Or if they feel like they've got a gun to their head and something very unpleasant is going to be happening very fast if they don't take care of this right here, right now, under those two conditions, no problem. But under those two conditions, it changes the chemistry of the brain instantly. And the problem is making that change is not under voluntary control. It's not something they can make happen. And so it's certainly not the case that these people diagnosed with ADHD have no ability to concentrate and focus. The problem is they can't make themselves do it in situations where they really do need to. Now, the next study uh, says brain imaging or computerized tests provide useful information to diagnose ADHD. Not true. We've gotten some very valuable information from imaging studies. And some of the computerized tests, most of them are not very helpful, but some of the computerized tests can provide us some information about ADHD. But the fact is these are not useful tools at this time for being able to make a diagnosis because in order to make a diagnosis, you need to be able to get a picture of how the person's functioning in a whole variety of settings. And if you're taking snapshots of the brain regardless of how sophisticated they might be and how pretty they may look, you know, when they print out the imaging studies, that's not telling you how the person's going to be able to function day by day in those domains of act, uh, that are so critically important in self-management for ADHD. ADHD is not primarily a structural problem. It's primarily a chemical problem. And for those things which are involved in structure, That research is very in its early stages at this point, and we don't have any norms which allow us to be able to make a diagnosis. So anybody who tries to tell you that you can use a SPECT scan or an MRI or an fMRI, you know, or some computerized boredom test to uh, to try to to make a diagnosis of ADHD uh, or to disprove it, uh, they're just not telling you the truth because those are not effective ways of making a diagnosis. You need a good clinical interview with somebody who knows what ADHD looks like, who can ask the questions and get the history of how the person functions in a wide variety of activities and tasks that they need to do relative to others of the same age. And then you put the pieces together, and hopefully you get some additional information from other people who know them and are familiar with their functioning. But that, these are not tools that are ready for use for uh, diagnosis. A lot of people think that because they have printouts or pretty pictures on the imaging study that you're able to make a more effective diagnosis because it seems more objective. But the fact is uh, it's, not more use, it's not useful for being able to make a diagnosis. It's not a valid measure, not if you understand what ADD is really about. Next slide says ADHD kids and adults are lazy. Well, they sure can appear lazy. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, and not doing the stuff you'd like them to do. Uh, but keep in mind, in light of what I was talking about just a few minutes ago, about they can focus well on some tasks but not at others, uh, keep in mind that what looks like laziness sometimes probably is laziness, as all of us are lazy sometimes. But the fact is that the problems that people really complain about in terms of being able to function on a job or in school or important things around the household, uh, sometimes they'll have some of the same laziness that most people do, but when you're seeing something that looks like a lot more, it's very likely that this is one of those things where they just can't get themselves to focus even though they know they should and may even want to. The next slide is, is picking up on a similar issue. It says, you know, kids and adults with ADHD need to develop their willpower so they can focus on work as well as they focus on activities they like to do. Well, this is somebody who's noticed that they can focus on things they like to do, but they're making an assumption which makes no sense scientifically. The concept of willpower doesn't make much sense here because it's not for lack of trying. Most people who have ADD have tried a lot over a long time. It may not be constant. It may not always be where you want to see it. But the fact is, willpower uh, is not something which operates independent of the brain chemistry. And if you have ADHD, it's a real problem. 
you know, and when you start thinking about willpower and, you know, saying, what the hell's the matter with you that you're not able to make yourself do this, as though somehow if only you will it hard enough, it's going to happen, uh, it doesn't appreciate the situation and it becomes a way of browbeating somebody. And an example which I frequently use when I'm talking about this because I feel like it captures uh, the experience of people with ADHD is a, a patient I saw a number of years ago and this is a guy example, but I think even the women uh, you know, who hear it can understand and, and see its application, who said, you know, I've got a sexual example for you for what it's like to have ADD. So having ADD is like having erectile dysfunction of the mind. If the task you're trying to do is something that turns on, you're up for it and you can perform. But if the task you're trying to do is not something that's intrinsically interesting, if it doesn't turn you on, you can't get it up. And if you can't get it up, you're not going to be able to perform and in that situation. It doesn't matter how much you may say to yourself, I need to, I really ought to, I should. You can't make it happen because it's simply not a willpower kind of thing. And I think that's one, probably one of the biggest problems we have in having people understand this disorder. It looks for all the world like it is a problem with willpower, and it's not. Now, the next point, motivation problems are not really a part of ADHD, uh, is sort of the other side of the same question. That often it looks as though people with ADHD just don't give a damn about things they really do need to give a damn about. But that's part of it. There is a chemistry to motivation, and it's very much a part of the same chemical problems that are involved in ADHD. Speaking of chemicals, uh, the next slide saying the dosing of medications for ADHD should be based primarily on age and weight. Well, there are some medicines for many, many medicines that are used in, in various fields of uh, medic medication treatments. Um, for other disorders, do go by age or by body mass and weight. But if you're talking about stimulants, what I'm about to say does not apply to the non-stimulants, and many of those are still weight-based. But for the stimulant medications, there is no systematic relationship between age and dosage, weight and dosage. It has to do with how sensitive is your body chemistry to this particular medicine. I treat little kids, I treat teenagers, I, see it, I treat adults. Most of the little kids are taking very small doses. But there are a few of them, just as small as all the rest of them, we have to go to the top of the adult dosing range to touch them because their bodies aren't that sensitive to it. Among the adults I see, most of them are taking fairly hefty doses of stimulants. But there are some of them taller and fatter than I am, and I'm not a skinny guy, uh, who you know have the same level of symptom severity, but... With them, we end up giving them a, a dose that's not much more than you give a typical six-year-old. And that can work perfectly well for them because their bodies are more sensitive to it. It's not a matter of age or weight. It's a matter of how sensitive your, body's, your body is to the chemistry. And that's particularly for stimulants. Next one, teenagers who take medication for ADHD are increased risk of developing a substance use disorder. The thing to know about this is it's true that they are at an increased risk of developing a substance use disorder, but not because they're taking medication for ADD, but because they have ADHD. The rate for the incidence rate for uh, problems with substance use, I'm talking now about basically alcohol and marijuana, the two most abused substances, uh, the rate of that among people with ADD is twice what it is for people who don't have ADD. And so if I see a kid at age five or seven and make a diagnosis of ADHD, I can tell that parent that that kid has double the risk of having a drug or alcohol problem at some point in his or her life, which will rise to the level of diagnosis. That doesn't mean for sure it's going to happen. It just means it's a larger risk group. However, it's also true that we've now got a number of studies. They just published a meta-analysis of 20 to 27 different studies, which indicate that when these uh, ADHD symptoms are treated effectively with medication during childhood and adolescence, you reduce that risk considerably. It doesn't confer protection in adulthood, but the risk is the risk of, of having a substance use disorder is built into ADHD for a whole variety of reasons we don't have time to talk about right now. But the fact is that adding the medication, if it's appropriately dosed and used as it should be, uh, that medication reduces that risk, it, it does not increase it. Which is not to say there won't ever be a problem, because there can be, but the fact is it's not increased, it's reduced. 
Last slide, if a child shows no clear signs of ADHD during elementary school, it's not likely that ADHD will occur during adolescence. That's wrong. You know, they used to have this notion that you had to have at least some of the symptoms of ADHD before you're age seven, but that was based on a fundamental flaw in understanding the disorder. There are many, I, I specialize in seeing high IQ folks with ADHD, and many of these kids who do very, very well in elementary school, particularly when they've got just one teacher most of the day who can provide a lot of this structure and executive function help that they need. When they move to middle school, things start getting a little shaky. Then when they get to high school, they kind of take more responsibility for dealing with multiple teachers and with different sets of expectations and different assignments due at different times with nobody reminding them about it. Uh, then many times you begin to see difficulty. Now, there's some parents who provide such effective scaffolding around their kids that you don't even see the problem so long as they're in, living at home. But if they then move off to go to college or university and there's no longer that parental scaffolding, that's the time when some of them crash and burn. So the question is, what is the context? To what extent is the person being faced with demands for greater ability to manage their own life? And when that happens, somebody with ADHD may be experiencing trouble when they get to more demanding circumstances like you get in high school or in college or getting a job. There's some people who do all right as long as they're still in school where things are pretty well spelled out for you. But then when it comes to getting a job and keeping a job, it gets a lot more difficult. So one needs to look not just at what the early childhood history is, but rather at how the person's functioning in the context of the demands of their life situation compared to other people of the same age. Yeah, we have tons and tons of wonderful questions. So to finish up on the question of the origins of ADHD, you made the compelling, uh, gave us the compelling information about the heritability. Um, two people are asking whether there are other, a couple of other factors that might be associated with developing ADHD. Are there any environmental factors? And another, um, another listener has a, has a daughter with an inattentive ADHD who's been diagnosed with a gene mutation that pro- keeps her body from processing E vitamins, which produce neurotransmitters. So, and and she's wondering, you know, so those are two questions that relate to non, I guess, kind of other associations with development. Yeah, there are things other than simply genetic heritability. Right. Well, there are some things. There's certain kinds of birth trauma, for example, Mm -hmm. uh, where uh, the child is deprived of oxygen, you know, the blue babies, um, and they can't get the respirations going very well. Uh, or whether there's trauma, um, you know, that requires treatment, med- medical problem or physical trauma, uh, it certainly can cause some difficulties uh, that you know can eventually develop into ADHD. Uh, there are certainly circumstances where uh, you've got uh, environmental risks, you know, like lead poisoning. There are some uh, unusual genetic uh, problems which can cause it, where it's not inherited directly from family members. Mm-hmm. But the vast majority of cases, you're going to see that there's somebody in the family, if you know what you're looking for. Okay. There is no um, ADHD gene. Uh, right. Uh, they've done a full genome scan now, and there, there's some interesting stuff about clusters of genes that seem to play a role in this. Uh, but this is not a one, uh, one gene, one disorder kind of problem. It's a complicated one in the gene. All right, so the gene that ongoing. prevents the absorption of, of, of vitamin B may or may not be part of this. We don't know for sure, right. I think, what you Yeah, saying. I don't think okay. there's enough research to nail that down, okay. but um, right. we've always got to leave room for some idiosyncratic kinds of things. Just like, you know, I've seen a few people who have some oddball allergies mm-hmm. uh, to certain kinds of foods. Uh, and it's very, very rare. Uh, it's not something you see very often at all, but there are a few people where if you clear those uh, substances that they're particularly sensitive to out of the diet, they do better. And I think that the claims made for uh, diet regulation are uh, huge, and the number of people who actually uh, are affected by this is pretty small. There are a number of people asking about diet supplements, um, okay, the diet supplements, let me just do a broad-based thing on, yeah. on 
uh, the non-pharmacological treatments for ADHD. Now there are many right, people yeah. who are afraid of these medicines because it's mm-hmm. like, well, if I'm giving my kid at age 7 or age 10 or age 15 medicines uh, that are being used to treat ADHD, how do I know it's not going to cause trouble over the long haul? How do I know that they're not going to become addicted to it? How do I know they won't misuse it and so forth? And, you know, the fact is that nobody can ever tell you honestly that there will, you can have a certificate from them saying there will be no problem with this medicine. There are some people who have one dose of an antibiotic and drop dead. But that's extremely unusual, and it's not a reason that we've stopped using antibiotics to fight infections. You know, but there are a number of people who want to make big claims for, well, if you eliminate this kind of food from your diet or if you add this supplement to your diet, uh, then that's going to fix the problems with ADHD. And you know, this goes all the way back to the, uh, you know, the early uh, work on diet and, and the Feingold diet and sugar and food additives and so forth. And when these things are tested carefully in blinded conditions where nobody knows which people are getting the substances or, or being kept off these particular things, uh, food substances, uh, and which are not. If it's, in other words, if it's a placebo-controlled study where you've got an honest blind reaction from somebody who doesn't have any stake in it, the data are very lame. There's no good scientific evidence of that. The numbers are too small. Okay. And um, I can extend that while I'm talking about non-pharmacological things to say that there are a couple of studies that have recently been done on alternative treatments, uh, which include, for example, these various computer programs that are widely right. advertised. A lot of days. interest in, in, in brain training. Well, and, med and brain right. training and these Neuro various feedback. other programs right. and, and neurofeedback. And the fact is that uh, there's a, a very... Uh, reputable set of researchers in Europe uh, recently published an article where they reviewed, did a meta-analysis reviewing the research on all these, and they came up with some interesting findings. And that is that when you look at what the source of the information is, it's similar to what I was saying about diet. If you have, for example, parents who are providing for their kids neurofeedback training, by paying for them, taking them to get it done, and so forth. Or one of these exercise programs like CogMed or, or others that are advertised. Uh, and you ask them, how's the kid doing? Often they will report very dramatic improvements, and they're very enthusiastic about it. However, if you use a person who doesn't know whether they're, where you, A, where you have a placebo control, and then something else is being done which is not comparable directly, to this, it's not the same thing. Uh, where it's a legitimate uh, scientific trial, and the reporter is not somebody who's got a stake in the outcome. They're not selling it. They're not paying for it. They're not invested in making the kid do it. What you find is a huge difference. Very enthusiastic reports from the people who are observing uh, what they are helping to do, but no clinically significant, no statistically significant differences between those who are on placebo and those who are not are taking the active treatment for those in those cases where the reporter is blinded to who's got it. Okay. So at least at this point, you know, right. this is not just one study. There are several studies, and the one that I'm referring to is a meta-analysis of multiple studies. When they really look carefully at the science behind these things, uh, it basically, what, they, what they'll tell you is that these various uh, memory, so-called working memory training programs, they do succeed in teaching the kid how, or the, whoever's using it how to get good at doing those exercises that they're doing for the training, but they don't generalize. I think I've read That's the same thing cool. about some of the, of the phonics training and dyslexia training programs as well. They can train you to do well on the test. That, that, yeah, that yeah, it's not training for the yeah. test, but uh, don't but expect it's that it's to generalize. To generalize, yeah, they're interesting. Um, and um, I want to move over to... basically a rip-off. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, everybody's know. hopeful, hopeful, you know, that, and yeah. Yeah, hopefully some well, yeah, will Many be times they'd like, you know, if you can buy this equipment, you know, just make people spend all kinds of money on it sometimes, but the fact yeah. is... The most effective treatment for ADHD is medicine. It doesn't work for everybody. It's effective for about 8 out of 10 people. 
Okay. Which means we've got two out of ten where the stimulant medicines don't work. And these are medicines we've had since 1956 in the case of methylphenidate and since 1937 in the case of the amphetamines. For some, it's huge how much it helps. Others, substantial but not huge. Others, it helps a little but not that much. And two out of ten, it doesn't do a damn thing. Right. But the fact is, there we've got very solid evidence, both of the safety, which again is not to say that nobody can ever have a problem with it, but if you're dealing with somebody who's basically healthy, you know, the uh, reports on, on uh, adverse effects are really reporting very small numbers, which is not to say there's nothing. What and, about the long term effects? There are a couple of questions here asking if there are studies. Yeah, there are studies on long-term been... effects, but, you, but here's the problem with the studies of long-term use. You cannot run a study uh, where you deprive somebody who's got a harmful disorder uh, of having the treatment for that disorder if there's an effective treatment. So if I were to announce that, uh, oh, come on over to Yale, we're going to run a treatment study uh, for kids with ADHD long-term and bring your nine-year-old kid in and enroll him in this class and, and, and we'll uh, give him either medicine or placebo. You've got to sign that you'll be, be willing to have it be either one. And we're going to keep that up for uh, eight years or ten years to see what the difference is between kids who have ADHD and are treated with medication that's prescribed for it and kids who are being treated with simply placebo where nobody's going to know until the end of the ten years who's on the medicine and who's not. You can't run that kind of study. Right. You'd be denying treatment. You know, the the IRB wouldn't let that board get through the approval board. And so, what we've got are studies that go at most usually. A, you know, a, some of them are just six months. Some of them are a year. Sometimes are sometimes are less. But what we do have is a, a large body of research in terms of it's not placebo control, but it's people who've been taking this stuff for a long time. You know, believe me, there are enough. Stu- there are more studies on stimulant medication for ADHD than there are for any other class of medicine you're going to look at. And that's not to say there are never any problems with it. There can be problems with it. But the the side effects are usually minimal and transient and can be adjusted for as long as you're dealing with somebody who's basically in good health. And as long as the doses and timing of the doses are being adequately monitored. Okay. I want to switch over to a topic that you raised, which I think is very interesting, which is that attention deficit disorder has a strong emotional component. Mm -hmm. Um, We've traditionally thought of it as a behavior or hyperactivity, um, but one of the points that you make, and there are a number of questions here about it, is hypersensitivity. Um, Someone asked what's the relationship of hypersensitivity and ADHD is, and a number of other parents have asked specific questions about children who are very explosive, who are very, yep. um, get frustrated easily, who are difficult, have a difficult time with motivation. Right. So yeah, could the you model comment? of ADHD, which I have written about, uh, has in it as one of the six clusters difficulty in managing frustration and in modulating mm-hmm. emotion. Right. And that uh, is addressing a kind of problem which basically boils down to this, that m- most folks with ADHD will report, and the people who live with them and care for them report, that they have a lot of trouble with certain kinds of emotion. Now, it's not the same emotion for everybody. For some people, it's just that they get frustrated easily, that little things will just uh, cause them to, uh, to flip out and sometimes make a big fuss or other times just struggle with the feeling that they want to punch somebody or break something. Usually it's not very long-lasting, but uh, the frustration can go from zero to 100 very quickly. Um, Other people, it's not that. It's that they they get worried very quickly. And for other people, uh, it's like they get an idea in their head and they want to get something or do something. And it doesn't matter how expensive it is or how inconvenient it's going to be for them or for somebody else or whether they're using time and money now for this that they know they need for something else tomorrow that's more important. It's just, I've got to have it now. And other people get involved in, what if this happened? Or what if that happened? You know, where it's worry, sometimes it's discouragement, where they just get frustrated and feel like, oh, this hasn't worked, everything sucks, everything's always going to suck, what's the use, why bother? Yeah, the motivation so you, issue seems very You serious. can get these emotions that hit, uh, like a computer virus can invade a hard drive. Mm -hmm. And that at that moment, the anger or the frustration or the sadness or the worry or the I've got to have it now, just take up all the space in the person's head at that moment. 
And it's very difficult for them to put it in perspective and put it at the back of their mind to get on with what they've got to do. And partly that's a working memory problem. Because, for example, if you get somebody who is pissed off at something that somebody else has done, you know, you did this or you didn't do that, or you won't let me have this now, and they get this sort of, the whole head fills up with with this frustration and the anger, uh, it's like sometimes they completely forget who they're dealing with and may say things that are very hurtful or hostile or do things that are hateful or hurtful without having any sense that they're doing this to somebody they love. Right. And who doesn't These are the parents, so the parents who are on the webcast are sort of asking, how do we cope with children who, well, you know, the times, many of them are teenagers who are yeah, very... Yeah, particularly teenagers where they're big enough that yeah. you can't necessarily pin them to the ground. <laughs> right. Uh, and I've, I've got a whole book I'm, uh, I'm just finishing on this that'll be out in March, talking about emotions and ADHD and teens and adults with ADHD. But um, the, there's no one recipe for it. Uh, what I can say is that although the diagnostic criteria for ADHD say nothing about uh, emotions as an aspect of the disorder, the fact is that many people with ADHD have these difficulties, and often if they have adequately adjusted medication, the, the usual medications for ADHD often are helpful with this. I've had people who are very anxious who have been on all kinds of anti-anxiety medications, that they get put on some of the stimulants and they'll say, you know, I feel more calm than I've ever felt in my life. Although you've also got to recognize that there are some people who are a little anxious. You put them on a stimulant, they're going to get way more anxious. Really? So, but, it's, it's uh, so sometimes this can be helped with just the usual first-line treatments for ADHD in terms of medicine. Okay. And the, the companies that are producing these medicines cannot make any advertising claims about the medicines helping with mood because that's not part of the listed symptoms of ADHD and that's all you're allowed to advertise on is because that's all you're allowed to test it on with the mm-hmm. FDA regs. Uh, but there also are some people where the anxiety or the, the, the quick to give up hopelessness or the I've got to have it now, these emotional things sometimes come on so strong that the stimulant medications are just nowhere near enough to help with them. And so for those folks, very often we'll have to use something else, and I tend to be reluctant to use. Uh, sometimes th- things like the SSRIs can be helpful, not always, but, but often. I'm thinking about things like fluoxetine, Lexapro, uh, kind of thing. Right. Like Paxil, Zol- are, there, are there any behavior modification techniques well, sure. there are that you things recommend? That, that or are useful. Or for clients? example, uh, it, often what happens is it gets caught up in the tensions in the family, where you have, you know, the kid shooting off his mouth and the parent then just getting, you know, very frustrated and often, uh, you know, shooting their mouth off just as quickly and, and you end up with shouting matches between parent and kid. And one of the most important things in situations like that is to be able to get it, to, to work out some signal where both parties back off. If either one of the people is getting to the point where they just can't manage the emotion anymore and chill out and then come back and talk about it later, not bury it forever, but to, to just you need a way of people being able to escape from the intensity of the confrontation and chill out enough to be able to think clearly about what's happening. So in terms and, of treating ADHD in the family or in, a, in, in a, with adults, you know, it sounds as if you're saying the behavior therapist there is a role for behavior therapy or non-medical treatment. Um, they can be. They can be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah that's something that that uh, you know somebody you know, just some good common sense in terms of of being able to back off and then also not throwing gas on the fire when you've got you know either a parent or a kid who's losing it. That's not the time to try to explain to them why they're wrong. Right. You, know, you want right. them to be able to get control of themselves and, and, you know, have more of their mind available to them at the time when you're trying to discuss it. Okay. You know, so that, that kind of stuff needs to be addressed with a clinician who's got a little bit of common sense or, or, or even just a friend who, who can help sort it out. All but right. then there are some cases where it's much more complicated, and sometimes we need to use medicines uh, for that. Sometimes we'll use, like, the noradrenergic stuff, like the Intuniv or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, in conjunction with a stimulant to try and deal with excessive uh, or impulsivity or, or uh, aggression. 
and sometimes uh, we have to use some of the antidepressants, and then when it gets into the point where it's sort of sliding toward bipolar disorder, then there are other medicines and mood stabilizers. Right. Uh, speaking of bipolar disorder, there are a number of questions about comorbidities, well, learning disabilities, autism, Asperger's, and then the questions I think range from how do I tell one from another, and how, and just in general, uh, is comorbidity is AD, does ADHD tend to stand alone, or is it frequently seen with other disorders? It's far more often seen with other disorders. Okay. And uh, one of the studies that was done on adults with ADHD uh, found that if you're an adult with ADHD, you have six times the likelihood of having at least one other psychiatric diagnosis at some time in your life uh, in addition to the ADHD. That doesn't mean wow. the person's stuck with it forever, but, you know, it, or take anxiety, for example. The incidence rate for anxiety disorders in children in the general population is about 5%. The incidence of anxiety disorders in kids with ADHD is about 25%. You know, and, so, and, and this question relates to depression also. Can both be treated? And can they be treated absolutely. simultaneously? Okay. Yeah, if I've got somebody coming in uh, with, who's meeting criteria for dysthymia, which is sort of low-grade chronic depression or for a major depression, uh, depending on the, on the person's situation, if they're, uh, you know, a, a acute major depression, maybe concern about suicidal thoughts or eating and sleeping are totally screwed up, I've got to treat the depression first and then go for the ADHD. But if it's somebody where eating and sleeping have not been screwed up and there's no evidence of any uh, risk of suicide, but they're just feeling miserable, generally then I'll go for treating the ADHD first because very often, if you can do that, it lightens the burden, and often the person's not feeling as bummed out, as hopeless about things. Right, right. Um, I guess we're running out of time here, unfortunately. We have so many great questions. Um, one last one. A uh, number of questions about whether ADHD is associated with high IQ or with giftedness. Well, a lot of people would like to believe that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but what I can tell you is somebody who specializes in dealing with high IQ folks, children and adults with ADHD, I can tell you that, that the distribution of IQ follows a, 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 for among people with ADHD is across the full range from low to high. Okay. Okay. Now, that makes sense. Having ADHD right. doesn't mean you're super smart. It doesn't mean you're super stupid. Uh, right. that you'll find some people who are all along the range, and also the other caution I'd make is it's silly to think about IQ as though you can measure it with one number, that there are many different kinds of smarts. And, right, uh, right. You know, the, the numbers we get on IQ tests tell us only about a certain number of them, but many of I these other questions that we've talked about are also covered in the uh, the book that you mentioned at the uh, beginning of the presentation, uh, my book on a new understanding of ADHD, and particularly the stuff on comorbidities. There's a whole chapter at the end talking about overlaps between ADHD and other disorders. Yeah, that is a terrific chapter. I mean, to the to the to our listeners, I really can't recommend Dr. Brown's book um, highly enough. I think I underlined almost every line in it. It's just really very clear and and a wonderful description. And I just want to pass along to you, Dr. Brown, as we're closing, a fan letter from um, one of the people who posted just posted this wonderful description to say that your book just really confirmed and recognized for her what the ADHD and how empowered her to understand the ADHD in her family, both herself and her children. And then, and I love this line. She said, when I'm reading your book, I'm reading my brain's autobiography. So <laughs> there. That's, that's <laughs> nice to hear. Uh, a really nice uh, concluding sentence. I really sentence. appreciate that. Yeah. I spend most of my working days talking with patients and trying to learn from them. So if I'm able to say something that fits with their experience, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. So with that, we will say goodbye, and thank you, and thanks, Dr. Brown, again. Thank, and you, all Susan, and thank you to all who tuned in. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Take care. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. That's